Um, This morning, we're continuing our series on the Gospel of John, and it's called That You May Believe. We want you to believe. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's going to change everything. And today I want to stress the importance of us knowing our testimony. And once you know your testimony, thinking about how to share your testimony. So today we're going to focus on knowing your testimony and then uh, sharing your testimony. If you don't know your testimony this morning, then all I really want you to think about is what's your testimony? What is it? Ask God to help you formulate that testimony. If someone said, tell me how you came into a relationship with Jesus Christ, what would you say? If you do know your testimony, then your task this morning as we see our message is to think about one person who you're not sure or you are sure doesn't know Jesus Christ yet. Think about one person, that one person. Who's that one person? Think of them right now. Keep them in your mind, and we'll talk about that a couple times. Because I want you to imagine what that person's life would be like if they met the Lord Jesus, and Jesus became their king, and what kind of decisions they would start making, and what kind of freedom they would start having, and what kind of redemption you would see in their life. And I want you to get excited about that, because in our story this morning, we're going to see a testimony. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. If you don't have your Bible with you, um, we have the section reprinted in the bulletin. And so if you don't have a bulletin, you can run out back real quick and grab one from our foyer. It is in the middle of the bulletin. Today we'll be looking at John 1, verses 35 through 42. We're going to start off by reading 35 through 39. And again, we're going to stress the importance of knowing your testimony and sharing it. And we're also going to watch what God can do when you have a weak voice. We'll see if God shows up. I'm sure he will. Let's begin by reading John 1, verses 35 through 39. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Well, four in the afternoon, that's the time when people were coming home uh, from most jobs Um, You know, you start at 6 a.m. with sunrise, and they they counted their day by sunrise to sunset. And and so 4 a.m., you know, or 4 p.m., people are probably coming home from work. Um, And then let's go over the characters real quick before we see how we're going to outline our message. Uh, First, you've got John the Baptist. We've seen him all throughout John 1 so far, but very, very soon he's going to take a back seat And Jesus is going to take the front seat in John's gospel. John the Baptist says, I'm just a voice. I'm preparing the way. I'm telling people to get ready for what God's doing in the world. And he's baptizing people and telling them to repent. So they're supposed to get ready for what God is doing. So John the Baptist is one of these main characters. Uh, We also see two people who were following John the Baptist as disciples. Andrew is one of them. And his friend, two disciples of John. We also see Jesus, who is the Messiah, the one who saves, the one who forgives sins, the one who is God's plan to redeem you and me and to send us back out into the world to love God and others and to preach the good news of Jesus. So Jesus shows up. And then at the end, we're going to see Peter, Andrew's brother, who becomes a major player in the first century Christian church. So those are the players. And what we're going to do today as we walk through this passage, we're going to look at five phrases, and that will be our outline. We've read three of them already. The first phrase we're going to look at is, look, the Lamb of God. It was in verse 36. Look, the Lamb of God. Now, John the Baptist has been talking on behalf of God, saying God's going to do something, God's going to do something, and he's got a whole bunch of excited followers. And they're following him and they're his 
disciples. And more than once, John has said, it's not about me. I'm pointing ahead to someone who's greater than me. A couple weeks ago, he said, the one coming after me, Jesus, is so much greater than me that I'm not even worthy enough to be his slave. Remember that? I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. That's what a slave did. And so John is just calling ahead and saying, look, 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 the one coming after me, he's greater than me. And he says, look, the Lamb of God. And as soon as he says this, his disciples leave him and they go follow Jesus. Because the Lamb of God was the one that it was all about. Well, we have a nice minivan. We love it. And in our minivan, we've got Sarah and I in the front seat. And we've got Jude and Eden in the middle row. And then in the back is Keenan and Ezra, our six-year-old and our almost five-year-old. And as soon as we pull up, we park along the curb. Not on the curb, but next to the curb. And then there's the, you know, the grass. And then there's the house where, where we're living. And uh, we, we pull up. And I put the car in park. And the kids know, because when you put our van in park, it makes a click and all the doors unlock. As soon as that happens, I hit the two buttons, which roll the two side doors open. And then here's what I do. I unbuckle my seatbelt and I get out and I walk to the door behind me to unbuckle Jude. Okay. So Kenan and Ezra have already unbuckled themselves, climbed over the console after fighting about who gets to climb over the console first. And they've gotten out the side door and they're running through the yard and already at the house. Because look, the Legos The Legos, you know, we're getting home and we've got an hour before dinner. They're allowed to play before dinner. And so for them, they're so excited. We're home and they see the house. Look, and they want to be the first ones out and they run as fast as they can. I can't believe how fast they do it, but the Legos are there. And for them, they want to play with the Legos or their other toys. And so they go as fast as they possibly can. And that's the excitement and the joy and the anticipation that these disciples of John have when John says, look, He's here, the Lamb of God, the one you've been waiting for, who's going to solve our problems, who's going to send us into peace and promise and hope and redemption, who's going to beat our enemies and give us our kingdom back. He's here. And so the disciples jump and they run and they're gone and they're following Jesus. And they get it because it's not about following a leader. It's not about following a teacher. It's not about following a pastor. It's not about following some self-help guru out there. It's about following Jesus. Jesus. And when you get it, you're going to run to him and you're going to stop following everyone else. Who have you been following this week? Which teacher? Which self-help guru? Which prophet in the culture? Maybe you're just following yourself. Whatever you feel like doing each day, you do that. And then wherever the wind blows you, that's where you blow. And that's a dangerous place to be following yourself, because you and I are not good enough to be followed for people to give their lives for, but Jesus is. And when you see who Jesus is, and you need to see it every day, when you see who Jesus is tomorrow, you will forget about all the other people, including yourself, that you're tempted to follow, and you'll follow him, and that will be the way to abundant life. Come. That's why we have church every Sunday. Because we need these reminders every week. There's a lot of reasons we have church, but one of the reasons is is we come before um, the throne of God. We come before God's word and we lift up Jesus high so that we can all be reminded that every other candidate for following and giving my life to is not worth it. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, is worth following. And that's what I hope you hear this morning. The Lamb of God's here. Get out of the van and run and go to him. That's the first phrase in verse 36. Look, the Lamb of God. Well, the second phrase comes from Jesus in verse 38. They're following behind him, and he turns around and says, What do you want? <clears throat> what would you say? Jesus shows up and turns around and says to you, What do you want? What would you say to Jesus? What would you say? I mean, seriously, think about it. What would you say to Jesus? What do you want? What do you want? They come up with this interesting answer. They say, well, well, we want to know where you're staying. 
But what they, what they really want is they want to spend time with Jesus. They want to see if he really is the Lamb of God, if he really is the one who's going to be worth giving their lives for. They want to see, so they want to spend time with him. So they ask this roundabout question, well, where are you staying? But the key really is that they wanted to spend time with Jesus. Let me say this, and I'm going to repeat it after I say it. Tomorrow and the next day and the next day and today, Jesus is the answer to the question you should be asking. Jesus is the answer to the question, whatever you're facing, the question you should be asking about that, que- about that problem, about that stress, about that issue, about that pain, about that failure. The answer to the question you should be asking is Jesus. And that's what they do. They want to spend time with him. If you're here this morning for Christian self-help, or for anything other than Jesus, you are going to be sorely disappointed. Why are you here this morning? Anyway, I hope you're here to meet with Jesus. If you look at where people go, and even Christians are tempted to go in the culture, you look to the New York Times bestseller list for self-help. Let me just tell you the top two books this week and see if you can notice the theme. The number one book in the country right now in self-help is from the author of Eat, Pray, Love. The book is called Big Magic. And the author suggests a way to overcome the obstacles to living a creative life by being more curious as opposed to being afraid. So whatever you face tomorrow, if you're having problems being creative, you're supposed to find this big magic and be more curious than fearful. And that will get you through it. And that will help you rise. Number two is the life-changing magic of tidying up. It's a guide to decluttering by discarding your expendable objects all at once and taking charge of your space. Now, isn't it interesting that the word magic shows up in both of those books? Why is the word magic in the self-help top seller list in the top two books? Because everybody knows we can't do this thing. Everybody tries to be the person they want to be, Christians, non-Christians, and we fail. We're not who we want to be. I have never met a person who in October said, you know what? Every resolution I set for myself on January 1st, I've kept perfectly. I've, if that's you, come tell me afterwards. You're the exception to the rule. I get it. I'll shake, I'll high five you. Actually, I won't because I don't want to give you what I have, but I'll congratulate you. (laughs) But that's just not the case for most people. So they look for the trick, the secret, the magic. The word magic is in both of those titles, but that's not the trick. Here's other things you're not going to hear this morning. Five ways to a healthier lifestyle. Now, I hope you live a healthier lifestyle. Some of you are thinking, I didn't do those five things this week. (laughs) But you know what? My kid got sick and I hugged him. And I always get sick. So I'm going to risk that every time. Here's what else you're not going to hear this morning. God approves of every single one of your wildest dreams. And you're going to get them this week. He's not going to, you're not going to hear that from me. Here's another thing you're not going to hear. <clears throat> you made it to church. Good job. You're done. <laughs> you did it. You did it. That's all it takes. Go to church and all your problems will be solved. You're also not going to hear three ways to make Christianity easier. Because following Jesus means taking up your cross and following him, even unto death. If you're here for self-help, you'll be sorely disappointed. If you're here because we're nice people and we like you, we do like you. I hope you feel liked here. But if you're here for that reason, um, it's going to fail you. Just like the, the guy from that joke, the son. Um, it's a Sunday and the mom is waking her son up for church. And he wakes up and he says, I don't want to go to church. And she says, well, why not? And he says, two reasons. They don't like me. And I don't like them. And the mom says, you're going to church. And I'm going to give you two reasons. First, you're 47 years old. (laughs) And second, you're the pastor. (laughs) You see, even a pastor could go to church just because he's liked. Why are you here? Are you here because you're liked? Are Are you here for the help? Are you here for the advice column? 
I hope, I hope you're here to meet the one true and living God and his son, Jesus, who can be your savior. You can meet with him and maybe you've already felt his presence and maybe you will before you go. I hope that's why you're here and I hope that happens for you. And that's what the disciples of John realized John says, look, the Lamb of God, and they're following Jesus now instead of John. And and Jesus says, what do you want? And they say, well, where do you stand? Because they want to spend time with Jesus. You want to know the magic? You want to know the secret? Time with your Lord Jesus every day is going to change your life. I promise you. I promise you. It's going to change these characters' lives too. Let's continue. Verse 39, Jesus says, come And you will see, that's that third phrase. And so that's the secret, I just said it. You want to know our secret? We spend time with the king of the world, with the king of the universe, with the king who sat on his throne in heaven and then to solve our problem, got off his throne, died in our place, defeated death, rose again, ascended into heaven, back to his throne, and now leads us as our king. We spend time with him. We pray to him. We study the scriptures. We read our Bible. We read about him in the gospel. And then we come together on a regular basis and we share about what King Jesus is doing in our lives. And that's the game changer. That's the magic. That's the secret. So these disciples begin a relationship with Jesus That's going to change them. When is the last time, if you're a Christian, you spent some serious time with Jesus through prayer and scripture? I mean, a significant, noticeable time. You stopped, you got away, you asked somebody else, hey, can you watch the kids for a couple minutes so I can just, I got to get into the presence of my Lord. When is the last time you did that? It's the secret. Now, if you're not a Christian or if you're not sure where you're at, you're still checking this thing out, kicking the tires here at Cornerstone. When's the last time you opened the Bible and took a serious look at who Jesus says he was and who the authors of the gospel say he was? I mean, if you're just kicking the tires, give it, listen to us and our testimonies, but, but go right to the word, go right to the gospels and hear Jesus himself and who he wants to be for you. When's the last time you took a serious, serious look at Jesus? It can change your life and it changes Andrew's life. Watch what he does next. Let's read verses 40 and 41. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. So the first thing he does once he finds the Messiah and spends time with the Messiah is he goes to his family and he says, I found it. The one you need, the one we've been waiting for, the one who can change your life. And I've really found him and I spent some time with him and he's changed my life already. And friends and family, can I tell you, can I tell you, can I tell you that I've had a life-changing encounter with Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. Have you been there when a person becomes a new Christian? It is so exciting and they're full of joy and energy and they are full of boldness and they're telling everybody and they're annoying all their friends. <laughs> but, but you know what? We need you here if you're a new Christian. We need to see that excitement and be reminded of that energy because it excites us and it reminds us, yes, that Jesus is still changing lives in this world. I heard a story and I didn't even ask permission, but I'm going to risk it anyway. Doug Mitchell, who led our life group this morning on Christians in the workplace, yeah, he shared it in the life group. So he, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to share it, Doug. I love you, buddy. He said that when he became a new Christian, he was working as a truck driver. And what he did was he went into the office early and he went into all the trucks and turned all the radios on to Christian radio. <laughs> Amen. Doug, you know, you annoy everybody. <laughs> But, but that's a good thing. You get everybody listening. Man, something happened to Doug. <laughs> something happened to her. Something happened to him. Something happened to me. And it's exciting. And your friends and family members should notice a little bit of a difference. And Andrew, 
has had an encounter with the living King Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, the sin remover, the Savior, the one who's going to bring joy to the world and peace to the world and redemption to his soul. And he can't do anything but share it with those he comes into contact with. So that's why we want to focus on that phrase, we have found the Messiah. And that's what Andrew does. He goes and he tells those that he lives with. And then there's more, verse 42. And we'll see our fifth and final phrase here. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. So think of that one person that I asked you to think about if you're a Christian who you're not sure knows Jesus yet in a real way. Think of that one person. Okay, Andrew finds the Messiah and he's thinking about Peter and he knows Peter and Peter's got some rough edges and Peter's got some problems. He's got some personality issues and we're gonna see Peter as the gospels go on and as Acts goes on and as even in Galatians, Peter's got some issues and he, he fails He's got some problems in his life. But Andrew has found the Messiah. And so he doesn't care about Peter, Peter's problems. He goes to Peter and he says, Buddy, who he's calling Simon, because that's still his name at the time. Simon, we found him. We found him. We found him. And you know what Andrew doesn't do? Andrew doesn't evaluate Peter based on who he is before he finds Jesus. He doesn't say, I wonder how Simon, my brother, is going to react if I tell him about Jesus. He doesn't say, man, I've been his brother his whole life and this guy's got issues. I don't know. I don't know if Jesus is going to do anything for him. I don't know if he's right. I don't know how this is going to be received. Andrew just brings Simon to Jesus. And you know what Jesus does? Jesus does the rest of the work. Jesus sees Simon and he says, you know what, Simon, now that you've found out who I am and you found out that I'm the Messiah, I know who you can be. Your brother didn't see it. Your brother called you Simon. I'm going to call you Peter because even though you've got all these problems and this mess in your life and these personality problems and you annoy your friends and you're going to annoy some other people too, you're going to be the rock that I build my church on. Nobody else saw it in you, but Jesus sees it in him. Look at what Jesus can do with somebody like you and me. Simon didn't see it, but Andrew didn't even see it. Simon didn't even see it about himself, but Jesus sees it in Peter. And he says, I have got plans for you. Now that you have come to the Messiah and have found me, now watch what I am going to do with your life. Jesus knows how to fix people. And he knows what he can do with your mess and your history, and your failures. And if at 9 p.m. last night, you were practicing your sermon, and you couldn't finish one sentence without hacking your head off, guess what God can do? I'm going 25 minutes strong, and I'm still going with a voice I didn't even have 10 hours ago. Guess what God can do with your weakness, and your failure, and your mess, and your sin, and your past? And take you. And when you find Jesus as the Messiah and you trust in him and no one else, he can give you a new name, he can give you a new job, and he can set the world on fire through you. And he's doing it this morning in your lives, and he's going to do it with us this week. But you know what Jesus has to be for you? He has to be more than a teacher for you. Did you see it in verse 38? Jesus says, what do you want? And they say, Rabbi which means teacher. You see, they came to him at first as a teacher. They wanted to be taught by Jesus. And maybe that's where you're at with Jesus. Man, I love some of this stuff he says about loving and forgiving and not casting the first stone and feeding the poor and helping, helping people. I love that stuff. Jesus is a really neat teacher. But Jesus is not going to change your life if he's just your teacher. And by the end of the story, in verse 41... The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the, not rabbi, which means teacher, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. The Christ was the one who was going to solve our sin problem, solve the problem with us being failures, solve the problem with us 
putting ourselves first instead of loving others, being prideful and lustful and being gossips and being selfish and being trying to climb up the ladder and knock everybody else down so we can get that promotion. All those things are sin. Putting ourselves first. Jesus can solve that problem. And the disciples left John the Baptist, even though he was baptizing. And they followed Jesus because they knew that John wasn't going to solve their sin problem. They left following John. They started following Jesus because Jesus was the sin remover the stain cleaner, the story changer, the testimony writer. And their lives were radically different because they found out that Jesus could forgive them of their sins. So they heard about repentance from John and then he knew, now I've got to repent of my old way and I've got to follow Jesus, believe in him, and then my life is going to be changed forever. So in conclusion... Two very brief things. First, know your testimony. Know your testimony. And here's how I want, I want to challenge you this week. I want you to write out your testimony. Write it out. If you don't know how to do it, if you don't even know where to start, I'm going to give you a very simple fill-in-the-blank paradigm, right? It's like Mad Libs. <laughs> I once was blank, but now I'm blank. Maybe for you, you have a radical story where you were in a complete mess at the bottom of the barrel and then, and then Jesus saved you out of that and you've got this radical transformative story. Great. Maybe for you, you don't even know where it all started. You've been following Jesus for a long time, but you know for you, you once used to be like this and then lately you've been noticing yourself more forgiving, more hopeful, more peaceful, more gentle, more nice to be around in a good way. I once was blind, but now I see. Is that your testimony? I once was a slave to this one sin, an addiction, but now I've been set free. I once was proud, but now I get it. It's not all about me. I've been humbled. I once was hopeless, And I cried myself to sleep every night. But now I sleep. I can fall asleep because Jesus has taken away my sin. He has called me loved. He's cleaned me up. I'm not perfect, but boy, is he doing something in my life. Fill in the blank, brothers and sisters. I once was blank, but now I'm blank because of Jesus. Know your testimony. Write it out this week. And second... Think about that one person, just one this week, just one. That one person you've been thinking of. Bring them to Jesus. Maybe you have to start the conversation. Maybe you've never had a conversation with your brother, Simon, (laughs) if you have a brother, Simon, about Jesus. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a friend. Who's that one person who you would just be so excited to see come to Jesus? All right, you got to talk to him this week and you can blame me. Here's how you can start. You can blame me. Say, I was in church. You know I'm a Christian, right? Say, I was in church this week and my pastor challenged me to just talk to one person and ask them, hey, what do you think about Jesus? Blame me. My pastor challenged me to ask one person, what do you think about Jesus? That's all Andrew did. Andrew said, hey, Simon, guess what? Guess what? We found the Messiah. Let me tell you about him. And then he brings him into the presence of Jesus. So maybe you need to start the conversation. Blame me. My pastor told me. Ask one person what you think about Jesus. Maybe for you, you need to continue the conversation. Can I tell you that God has had this message planned, and I didn't even know it, for months and years and forever because God is in control It's so exciting to see uh, what God's going to do. Uh, Maybe, maybe you're going to take one person and you're going to give them the Gospel of John or you're going to give them a Bible and you're going to say, hey friend, will you please read? Read the Gospel of John. Read the Bible. We have a couple of these left in the foyer. If you think one of your friends or family members or coworkers would read a little bit, challenge them to read this, the Gospel of John. It's out there in the foyer, and we have just ordered more this week, and there should be a bunch in the foyer because I'm going to challenge you again next week to hand them out. 
but two of you this week started to continue the conversation with some people about the gospel. And both of you came to me and you asked me for some materials and both of you got them this week and you started, I have a a gospel Christianity series that you can take people through. We've taught it here before. But two of you started this week. I'm so excited. One guy, one girl, you came to me and said, how can I, what can I use? And I gave you these materials and now you're going to start taking people. One of you, you're taking your friend through this and another, you're taking a small group of people through it. That is so exciting. If you need resources to disciple other people, we have them. We will print them and pay for them and give them to you. So continue the conversation if you've already started it. Because Andrew had no idea that his brother Simon would become, when he meets Jesus, would become Peter, who preached a sermon on the day of Pentecost And thousands of people came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior that day. Andrew could not have ever guessed that that was going to happen when he just brought his brother into the presence of Jesus. Who knows what God can do with you and your testimony. I want to end with a testimony. This is from Emily Armstrong. If you want a good resource for testimonies, go to ChristianityToday.com. They have some testimonies. And then this is the newest um, issue, um, the October issue. And in the back of every magazine, there's a testimony. And they're all different. And they're people from different backgrounds. And Emily Armstrong was a member of the Baha'i faith, which talked about being good enough and morally good enough to change the world. And because of what you are going to be doing in the world, you'll be good enough and you'll change the world. And the world will be good enough. And in one generation or two, there will be no war anymore and stuff like that. So she was practicing in that. And she was also thought it would be a neat side job to help sell online pornography. So she was helping. She didn't realize it at the time. She was helping put up ads on places. Turns out she got ripped off by the company and they never gave her any money. How about that as your story? But listen to this. Listen, maybe you're her. And you need to come to Jesus today. Maybe you're her friend. Watch how all this comes together, how God put this whole thing together this week. Around the time I abandoned that job with the online porn company, a former classmate invited Aaron and me, now engaged, to attend Alpha, a course exploring the basic teachings of Christianity. Our friend had just become a Christian. And even though we thought that was strange, we didn't want to hurt his feelings. Now think of your friend Maybe you think they're going to push back. I don't really want to hear about that. Maybe they'll listen. Or maybe they'll come to church next week just to not hurt your feelings. After our leaders welcomed us to the 10-week Alpha course, I made a face at Aaron. 10 weeks? But we kept going. We learned that no human can enter God's presence by working hard enough or by being morally good enough. But that in God's mercy, Jesus gave up his life on the cross so that we may be saved from the wrath we all deserve. See, they heard he was the sin remover. After the Alpha Course, our friend continued to evangelize us. But Aaron still didn't think much of Christianity, her fiancé. Several months later, now maybe this is one of your friends. I know people like this. He decided that if he was going to make fun of Christians properly, he should read the Bible. Fine, give me your book. I'll read it so that I can accurately make fun of you, silly fairy tale believing people. I know quite a few people who think that about Christianity. Uh, watch what happens. I had read the Bible and participated in a youth group as a teenager, but seeing Aaron come home with one, I thought it would be good for me to read it again. And then she goes on to explain. They both start reading the Bible. These non-Christians start reading the Bible, start hearing about Jesus because their friend, this new Christian said, will you come with me to church? They started to get attacked spiritually and supernaturally. And I don't even want to go into all the details. It's an incredible story. Go online and read it. I can send you the link if you email me. She woke up and had an absolutely terrifying vision in bed with her fiance. But in that moment, despite the terror... I understood that Jesus was my hope because of what she had heard. 
So there in that bed, I shared with Aaron, I pleaded with God to save me. I already knew that I had to repent of trying to be holy through a faith that promised perfection, of helping to sell online porn, and ultimately of relying on myself, my own self-help master. As I prayed in repentance, the fog that I cowered under lifted. There was a sudden clarity. Yes, this is true. This is real. Jesus really is the Son of God. Then I waited to see what Aaron would do. Would he turn to Christ as well? Would he go back to sleep as though nothing had happened? I worried that I might have to say goodbye to my fiancé, that we might be on different paths from here on. Though it was only moments, it felt like eternity. And then Aaron asked Jesus to save him too. And she ends with, And we were free. Know your testimony. I found the Messiah. And then bring one person this week into the presence of Jesus. Start the conversation. Continue the conversation. And pray that they too, in the face of our Savior, who loved that friend that much to die for them on the cross and even defeat death for them, so that they could be set free. Let's pray this week that more and more people, and maybe you in the room today, meet Jesus and be set free. Let's pray. God, you are our strength when we are weak. You are our joy when we despair. You are our hope because we've tried it our own way, Lord, and we can't do it ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We can't solve the problems in this world ourselves, but you can. And you changed lives and you changed Andrew's life because you brought him into a relationship with Jesus. And then he brought his brother Simon to Jesus and Jesus fixed him too and called him Peter the rock. And you built your first century church on his testimony and the testimonies of other people just like me and the people in this room who have a blank past and have a blank future. You, Lord, fill in the blanks, change our lives, and help us see other people, our friends and loved ones, be set free by a relationship with Jesus Christ. Make it happen this week. Make joy overflow in this community as lives find the true Messiah and become set free. Set people free for your glory in the name of your sin-removing, freedom-giving, Savior, Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's at the cross where love ran red, where we surrender our lives. Please stand and join us to worship.